Mr. Counts has more than two decades of experience in microfinance, starting as a Fulbright Scholar at Grameen Bank in Bangladesh. While at Grameen Bank, he worked and studied under Nobel Laureate Professor Mohammed Yunus. Counts became Grameen's Foundation's first executive director in 1997. Today, under Counts' leadership, Grameen Foundation impacts an estimated 30 million lives in Asia, Africa, the Americas, and the Arab world. In addition to small loans, big dreams, he is the author of Give Us Credit, and most recently wrote about microfinance as a platform for the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Counts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think, oh good, so a little microphone, and I guess this is being recorded. It's okay if I walk around a little bit and you can follow me? Great, uh, and I hope you all can follow me. Um, well, listen, it's uh, to see a lot of people from Google here, to people also friends in the Boston community that have come out, and, uh, um, and of course I want to thank uh, Amber for being our kind of host and coordinator here, the whole team that's putting this together. We're very grateful. We have a, a relationship, Grameen Foundation, a relationship with Google that spans a lot of people and offices, ours and yours, uh, for those of you with Google. Um, so to make this connection here in the Boston office is, is terrific. Uh, and just, I have to say, um, also, I, I just want to thank, if he ever sees this video, uh, my, um, my cousin, Steve Hackessa, who works in the New York office, was, as I understand it, one of the impetuses of us getting connected with you all and having this event here, and uh, appreciate him playing that role. Um, but, uh, y you know, uh, for people to come out and hear about even something uh, that is to many is innovative uh, in the field of poverty reduction on at a time when the world is kind of going a bit crazy um, and in a way that is that is really being harmful to some people and is and for others it's creating a lot of worries and anxiety to come out here and hear what I have to say and uh, and uh, get or buy or whatever um, one of my books, I really appreciate it. Uh, and so uh, thank you all for coming out. I'll try to make this interesting, interactive. Um, I don't know whether you, it, you're you relieved or worried, but I'm not going to show you a bunch of slides. I'm just going to tell you about some of the things that I've been doing the last 20 years. Um, microfinance is ultimately about people, their capital, their setbacks, their triumphs. Um, so just to ground it in, in something very tangible, I'll just tell you about uh, a few weeks ago I was in the Philippines and I was, um, uh, I was doing a site visit with a group in the southern Philippines uh, in an island called Negros. And it was, you know, we spent the day visiting around. They said, oh, there's one more visit we think would be a good idea to do. And I said, oh, well, okay, if you, let's just do it, make it quick, you know. And they brought us to Emma Morales. Now, Emma uh, was someone where uh, they brought us to kind of a, uh, a little co mini complex. And so basically, imagine this room here, kind of, you, I guess you can kind of keep that part, divided into thirds. And the first third was um, a little motorcycle repair shop. Uh, and there was motorcycles, including motorcycles where, like, you know, the old Batman and Robin, where they have a, <laughs> the one where, like, the sidecar. Anyway, it was very popular in the Philippines, so they were repairing those. The middle third had a second floor, and it was a restaurant, and the third third had a um, kind of a little general store. Um, but again, the whole footprint of it about the, this room. So, and there was a huge amount of activity. Wow, look at that. Jeez. Um, um, so the, uh, the middle third of it, Anyway, so the whole the whole thing, it was a lot of activity, bustling, uh, and uh, and you know motorcycles coming in, people clearing tables, moving out, the store, um, all sorts of signs, new products, buy your minutes, prepaid minutes, etc. So I, I was talking to this woman through a translator, and I figured this was a woman who was already must have been in pretty good shape economically before she got her first loan from this organization, because I mean you know, this was just a real big success story. And so Emma, we got to talking to her, and what I what realized quickly was that she started in a very humble way with about a loan of $60 that she had used to start selling just food outside of a high school nearby. Uh, and then her second loan, they got some a little bit more money, like $100, $110, and bought a kind of banged up motorcycle. And basically, she and her husband taught her, because they realized it was worth a bit more than they were paying. Someone was just unloading it. And so they taught themselves how to repair motorcycles. Um, and uh, 
and little by little, and she built this kind of empire, but it was an empire for her. I mean, it really felt like it. And so, but what it really hit home, that she wasn't this, you know, one of the kind of advantaged people who come in already doing pretty well, is we were talking to her, and she said, uh, she said, well, you know, I'll just, you know, I said, how was life before you got this first $60 loan? And Emma said, she took a deep breath. She said, let me explain it to you this way. Um, we used to, my kids used to go around the neighborhood to get the scraps, the leftovers from neighbors that kind of who were a little bit better off that we would feed to our pigs because we had, you know, one or two or three pigs most of the time. Um, and, uh, and one time we got a, the leftovers and my child kind of looked at them and said, you know, they're, there's, I don't know if it was chicken or pork or whatever, and there's, I said, Mom, there's some kind of meat still on the bone here. Do, do you think it'd be okay if we pull it out and actually have this for ourselves, uh, not to feed to the pigs? Um, and, and just that whole moment, and she started weeping, telling the story, uh, very raw emotion. Uh, and, uh, and she said, here was this thing where, you know, the child was embarrassed to say this to me, but this was the, but still was really, hadn't, we hadn't eaten meat in a while. So, so this is, these are the people that microfinance is trying to serve, um, it, people who are really at that, at the real bottom of the heap, uh, and um, who are just kind of written off as the hopeless poverty cases. Uh, and, and yet some of them have within them this ability, this latent ability that can get activated. Uh, and uh, again, she was a very recent, very tangible example. And so, so this book, uh, Small Loans, Big Dreams, a lot of it is telling these stories in, in, uh, a lot, in real depth. Uh, I, I spent two years interviewing about 10 women, uh, five in Chicago, five in rural Bangladesh. And these are their stories interspersed with some analysis and some of the larger picture. And so, so anyway, if you, if you got or will get uh, the book, uh, it'll, it will go into much more depth with stories like that, including stories that didn't turn out nearly as, as good as, as Emma's. Um, but let me tell you about, a little bit about my journey. Um, in uh, in microfinance, um, by the way, I, I, I just I'll say this. Maybe I'll then forget about it. One of my two of my old, best friends in the world, or I just found out an hour ago, are, are trying to get here from Newton, Massachusetts, and so I keep looking to see if they're here. I think how could they be lost? It's their town. But anyway, but anyway, so uh, if they come, you'll know it because I'll get all excited. But um, but my own journey. Um, I, if you, I have to go back to my time, at, and I tell this briefly at the beginning of the book. Was it Cornell? where uh, I was in the mid-80s, uh, and I was developing a social conscience. I looked around who else was in, had it seemed to have a social conscience. And, and a lot of people, most of the people who did there, at least I contact with, they were involved in two things, opposing apartheid and opposing the wars in Central America. And what I realized is, is I didn't get energy from being against things. Some people clearly did. I, I said, well, I had to figure out what I could get behind that was good, that if apartheid wasn't there, or wars weren't there, that what would you bring that you want to have and expand? Uh, and someone told me about microfinance uh, and uh, what Muhammad Yunus was doing. Um, and uh, I kind of read about it. And then uh, um, I wrote him a letter, uh, a letter that has all of the naivete you would expect of a 19-year-old and then some. And it went something like this, Professor Yunus, I think you're doing something really good. I think you're on to something. I said, I want to come to Bangladesh in about a year when I finish my degree and help you spread it all around the world really quickly. <laughs> I really wrote that. Um, and he, God bless him, he wrote back. He said, come on over. And a little PS, he said, try to learn a little Bengali before you come here. It'll help you uh, to really learn what we're doing and uh, interact. So I, that same day, I opened up the course catalog for Cornell. And as I was to learn later, Cornell was only one of five universities in the country that taught Bengali as a four-credit four course. <laughs> so I immediately enrolled and prepared myself, moved there, got a Fulbright Fellowship. Um, and um, I went there. And, I, and so I got there. Grameen was just was one fourteenth of its size today, half a million borrowers. And I was once telling the story of, at actually at Google and Mountain View uh, about this. And I was I'd heard that kind of uh, Larry Page, whose older brother has been a friend of ours for a long time, was that he might come. And I didn't see him. I started talking. And then um, 
And I said, you know, getting, I said, for me, given my chosen field, being at Grameen in 1988, it almost feels like being the, like the 14th employee of Google. You know, <laughs> a, like a great, like a leading company uh, in your field, arguably the best, and being there very early when you could actually do things. And so this guy in the back started cracking up when I said that. And it was, it was Larry Page, sit up, propped up against the uh, pillow, uh, up against the wall on the way back of, the, of this, uh, I think the, the, uh, this cafeteria, strange little room that they had there. Um, so he thought that was very amusing. I don't really know why, but, <laughs> but, uh, but he did. Anyway, uh, Quirk, you said some humor. So, so I, went, um, I went to Bangladesh, uh, learned, and I'll tell you the thing that I really learned um, when I was there, you know, so you're trying to think, you've picked a global issue like poverty, and one of the things I learned was that uh, the poor, as they're portrayed in the media, uh, that we all uh, get, uh, um, is poor portrayed as kind of passive and helpless, right? Most of the time we see them as when? Is when there, there's some, been some disaster, something, hurricane goes through, cyclone goes through Burma. So I, I sat there and I, I would watch people and I said, people are so, working so hard, mostly at their own businesses. Uh, and in fact, in fact, a higher percentage of business ownership among the poor, the poorer you go in most societies, the higher the percentage of business ownership, if you define business in a very kind of broad way. And, um, uh, and so I was trying to figure out what this was about. And someone later said to me, said, Alex, well, think about it. A Ford Foundation official who became a lifelong friend said, in Bangladesh, there's no social safety net. There aren't enough jobs. In fact, I lived in Bangladesh for six years, never saw a help wanted sign. Not a single one. And so what are your life choices? Your life choices are to work for yourself or to starve. And given those choices, people make some go at it. They try to do that, do something. So if you're, wow, thanks for bringing some chairs for people in there. People who are standing, wow. Ah, and my great friends, Robin Metallic Perkins. Okay, welcome, guys. So, um, so then the question is, if, if these people are the, the grassroots capitalists, the ultimate capitalists with a really enormous amount at stake, whether they eat um, in the evening, depends on how their business goes in the morning, then the question is where do they get their capital? And, uh, and so that, my big insight there, about nine months in, Dr. Yunus sent me off to the Philippines. So take a look how microfinance is working there, Alex. So I said, okay. And I went to talk with a street vendor in Manila. Are there any Filipinos, Filipinos here, yeah? Yeah. So, um, uh, welcome. So I went to a street vendor and I said, where do you get your capital, the, the money to stock your store? So I get it where everyone gets it. I said, where's that? And um, you know what I'm gonna say? Mm -hmm. So I get it from a 5'6". Huh? I get it from a 5'6". I said, what's a 5'6"? I said, everyone knows what a 5'6 is. I said, please tell me, I'm a foreigner, I don't know these things. I said, a 5'6 is where you borrow 500 pesos in the morning, and you pay back 600 pesos in the evening. Right? So I said, the capital, the cost of capital for the poor not ha in, in the informal market is enormously high. And so, I started to have an insight, wow, this is how people stay trapped while they're working extremely hard. So, and so I, I then started later, particularly I said this vision, wow, my God, this was a great opportunity. If you could undercut the loan sharks, call them money lenders, you could do one of two things or both. You could have an enormous social impact, just allow people to retain more of what they're producing, or you could actually create by a thriving business because um, the margins are so high. Why didn't people do that? Why did it take, Professor Yunus to really do that and institutionalize it in the way that he did. Um, generations of people graduating business school. No one, think, no one got that. Um, and so the, the insight, I, I guess the, the, what I really concluded was that fundamentally those, particularly those of us with a lot of education brought up with certain um, uh, kind of ideas, that we grossly underestimate the capabilities of the poor in our own society. Um, who, generally speaking, especially in developing countries, lack that education that we have. And I, I th just illustrate that with a little story that I tell sometimes where Professor Yunus, in the, right when I was leaving Bangladesh, I lived there for six years, coming back to start Grameen Foundation, um, he started a phone company. Some of you may have read about this, Grameen Phone, Grameen Telecom. 
And, um, <clears throat> and people said, uh, Professor Newsom, you've had a lot of good ideas, sir. This isn't one of them. I said, well, I said, because phone, you're going to loan people money to buy the phone, right? Yeah, I'm going to loan them people money to buy the phone. And, um, and then what the idea was that the Grooming borrower would then become the phone company for their village. Just a pay phone, but a human pay phone with a, with, without a, any you know, wire attachment, a wireless pay phone. And he said, people are going to borrow money, buy the phone, and this is, they're going to be totally befuddled by how to operate a phone. Uh, and, uh, and yet they're going to have to pay off the loan. It's going to really drag them down. It won't work. The phones will break uh, and so forth. So Professor you said, if that case, I'll forgive the loans. But I want to try it. Maybe we can even get one phone lady per village, 50, 68,000 villages in the country. Let's try it. Uh, business plan was said 50,000, but you know, I thought it could go a little bit bigger. So a year after launching this program, uh, Professor Eunice went out to meet with some of the initial batch of phone ladies, as they came to be called. And so uh, he said to one of them, he said, um, how, uh, can you just tell me, you seem pretty, you know, using the phone now, how many months did it take for you to become comfortable using the phone? And uh, I actually, actually, if I had a, like a regular basic cell phone, this tells the story better, but imagine this is what a normal cell phone looks like. It's just the backside of a Blackberry. And so um, he said, uh, how many months did it take for you to become comfortable using it? And the woman kind of scratched her head. This is a national figure. It said, Professor Eunice, to ask me that question, I think you must own a very complicated phone. <laughs> See, because Professor Eunice, my phone, it only has 10 numbers. <laughs> yeah, and so because it was going to help put my child through school and repair the roof of the house, it said, it took me about one minute to learn each number. So I was in business in 10 minutes. So another woman who'd been brought from a nearby village was, was observing this conversation and said, said to Professor Yunus, you know, Professor Yunus, I get a lot of calls from uh, overseas. A lot of Bangladeshis live overseas. I'm sure a lot here in Boston. Um, and so I realized that after seven months doing this, I learned the country code of every country in the world. And I, and I could tell the time difference between Bangladesh within an hour or so of about 20 countries that would most frequently people call or call from. And so I looked at him and says, ah, Dr. Yunus, you still seem kind of uh, a little uh, uh, doubtful about this. I have a challenge for you. Challenge is you give me the name of a country and a phone number, and I'll dial it blindfolded. <laughs> and if I don't get it on the first ring, the phone is yours, because I hear you need one of these simple phones. <laughs> and, and, so, so, and, and it's kind of the story of, um, um, hi guys, hi Al. Um, the, um, I have old friends showing up, it's really fun. But um, the, uh, um, but we underestimate people's capabilities. Dr. Eunice, I mean the basic story of microfinance, boiling it down, is Dr. Eunice kind of through a pro iterative process of talking to people in the villages, got this truth, put money behind it, and when people told them, it was going to fall apart because fundamentally his assumption was wrong. He said, no, your assumption is wrong. Mine is right. And that became the whole growth of Grameen Bank and the, and the, micro, um, the microfinance uh, movement. So um, in a kind of in a nutshell, so I try to tell the whole evolution of it, in fact, um, of it and his whole journey. In fact, uh, I'll tell a story or two about the women in the book, but one of the things that's interesting is I had such access to Professor Eunice, particularly in the early 90s um, and the late 80s, is that actually this book is being, I, I learned, is being used as one of the um, uh, sources, main sources of, of, in terms of print, for a movie that's being developed about his life, kind of on the scale of the movie Gandhi. Uh, and there's some very entrepreneurial people in France that are advancing that movie, and they actually went through a whole legal process, oh my god, lawyers, um, to get the rights to you, draw from my book for the movie, because there hasn't been a real full biography of him. And so it gives you some insight into how he got this going. But in terms of the stories of the women, I, I had to um, not only learn Bengali, but the dialect in the one part of Bangladesh. And, uh, and I just, one of the things that was uh, interesting, hey, um, was uh, there's a woman who was, I got to know very well. Her name was Noni Balagosh. And if you know Indian names, or Bengali names, I should say, probably, uh, she, her, the, the, 
the, what the, the economic activity her caste was most associated with was making sweets. Uh, and so, but they'd given that up. So like Emma Morales in the Philippines, you know, basically all there was, the husband worked during the year when there was work in the, in the fields. They had no land. When there wasn't work, they didn't have anything, any income. So with a, with a loan that, again, between 50 and $100, uh, this family got going to make uh, sweets. And, and they ultimately grew into a business where they would make the building blocks of sweets in Bangladesh, which is cottage cheese. And they make it in, you know, in bulk. And so after a few years and cycles, and then they wanted to buy a cow because then you didn't have to buy milk on the open market and so forth. And I had to learn all about this business to write a treatment of it. And so at one point, they got a contract with a, with a, uh, a sweet shop in Dhaka. And they would supply what basically was usually between, think of one duffel bag full of cottage cheese, low order, two duffel bags full was a bigger order per day. Um, problem was, Dhaka was about uh, 80 miles away. So they'd produce it during the day, and I observed this process many times. Then they'd fill up the duffel bags, and then they'd 10 miles bike to the bus stand, um, and then usually the husband and one of the sons or whatever would get on the bus, take it to Dhaka, deliver it, get paid, get the order for the next day, come back. So, you know, and then they'd do other things too. And now the capital flowing through this business was, was pretty significant. After starting with, again, a, a, the activator was a loan of under $100. Well, interestingly, there was a big political crisis in Bangladesh in 96. And at one point, the opposition party threatened to kind of um, attack and light on fire any vehicle that was moving for 14 consecutive days. And so there was no motorized transport in the country. And I said, what happened? And I, saw, and I was stuck in Dhaka. So I came out. I said, Noni Bali, did you lose the contract? Did they say it was OK, that you could just start up again once the strike was over? Um, and I actually began to wonder what happened when they had the, like, strikes of one or two days, which are fairly common. I said, oh, no, no, no. I said, no, we just, we just would go through the same process during the day. And instead of biking 10 miles to the bus stop, they just bike there. And then they bike another 70 miles into Dhaka with, say, 40, 50 pounds laying across their bicycle, one of them or two of them, deliver it, then bike all the way back the next morning. Um, and then they'd start the process over again. So this is what the kind of work, the kind of hard work the kind of, um, that people are doing. Uh, and again, this was not someone who is, was a kind of advantaged poor. In, this was someone who you came across them, again, had this capability. But in terms of the economic situation, a day laborer really at the bottom of a heap even for Bangladesh. And so, so as I heard, as I learned these stories, wrote them up, and a corresponding batch of them which, which uh, uh, from uh, inner city in Chicago where there was a modified version of Grameen operating, this became the lifeblood of the book. And again, some stories were more successful than others. I tried to t really relate them honestly. Uh, microfinance, like many things in life, are really two, at best, uh, two steps forward, one step back. And so I tried to tell the advances, the, the setbacks. Um, uh, let me just sit to, uh, say two other things and then a little bit about our work with Google. Um, one is with Grameen Foundation, which we started 10 years ago. And so I tell the thing you should know about this book is the field work for it, I don't know if this will make it more or less interesting to you, was done in the mid-90s, right before I moved back to start Grameen Foundation. I couldn't have done both. Then after the Nobel Peace Prize was awarded to Professor Eunice in Grameen Bank, uh, I wrote some significant updates of what's happened in the, the 10 years, the latest 10 years. And those are set off at, at the end of most chapters, where whatever's discussed in the chapter, you know, what's, what's happened. So, one of the, so I told the story of what happened with Grameen Foundation, and uh, started very small. Uh, in fact, Dr. Eunice gave me seed capital of $6,000 uh, to start Grameen Foundation in 1997. Fortunately, I was too naive to know that's not a lot of money to start an organization with. Um, and, uh, but uh, so we got going. And, and you know, what we did initially is I think the focus was not to support his work in Bangladesh, which was so advanced then and much more so now, but to, to help a, a group of people who were trying to adapt, especially microcredit, the basic uh, program, in other countries, in India, Nepal, Nigeria. And the first few years, it was mainly about um, uh, it was mainly about just drawing attention to it, just trying to get people to pay attention that there were people, I mean, if you, people happen to know about Grameen Bank, that it was being repeated in other countries, that was the news we were trying to bring. Uh, and this could be a global solution, right? I mean, hearkening back to this crazy letter I wrote when I was at Cornell. 
Uh, this is what we're trying to do. But then we were approached, we were approached by three practitioners who were doing, applying for me in India in, um, in uh, the spring of 2000. And they, figuring that just we could raise a lot of money was snapping our fingers. Uh, they said, Alex, we're struggling along. We're reaching about 46,000 borrowers collectively, these three groups. If you raise us a million dollars this year, we can use that to leverage another seven million in India, um, and we could quadruple in size in two and a half years. That's our that's our plan. And I said, and I you know I didn't know what to tell them that our total annual budget then was barely a million dollars. Um, but I said, uh, all right, we'll we'll try. And so I called up. Uh, a, a guy who'd been volunteering with us, uh, Steve Rockefeller, sounded like a name that maybe you could raise some money. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's uh, grandson of Nelson Rockefeller, and uh, and this is where I really found my voice as a fundraiser, as someone connecting people of wealth and connections and wealth in terms of financial resources and microfinance. And we spent the whole of May uh, with all of his contacts, and frankly, a couple of people we just <laughs> met on the street. Um, and basically, we raised a million dollars. And we raised a million dollars in commitments. Now, at this point, the NASDAQ was going from 5,000 to 4,000. And so actually deliver, getting people to deliver on the pledges turned out to be a bit of an adventure at the end of the year. But we got the money there. They, um, and the organizations, as it turned out over time, met their goal to quadruple, but they did it six months early. And that became, for those who, the people who contributed money and for us, it gave us real confidence that this thing could work and that we could add value. Um, money being a basic um, uh, value we could bring, we, we ultimately ended up doing many things more than um, just money, but that was the, that's the kind of the lifeblood of, of microfinance in so many ways. So uh, now the uh, little time passes, two of our board members, uh, who, actually, they were later to become board members, I should say, went to India to figure out what we could do um, what we could do if we raised another million dollars for India. I'm feeling kind of pretty optimistic. And so he called me on the day after Easter 2001 and, uh, and, and called me from their hotel room. We had a bunch of meetings here. And, uh, and again, now the whole economy was really starting to um, slow down in a significant way, uh, in some ways not unlike today, uh, and said, Alex, We've had a revelation. The money's all here. And I said, good, because it's not here. <laughs> and he said that there was just a lot of, the banks had a lot of money to lend. There was a lot of liquidity in the market. And in fact, there were all sorts of incentives for them to put it into poverty programs, but they didn't really know how. And, the, and so microfinance could emerge as a partner to the banks, particularly under this law that's kind of like the Community Reinvestment Act here, but even the targets are higher. So. So what we did that year is we all raised for India about a quarter of a million dollars. But what we did is, instead of giving it directly to these groups, we gave it to them to use as loan guarantees for borrowing from Indian banks. And after a lot of negotiation, the banks, on average, let them borrow 10 times what they put on deposit. So we turned a quarter of a million dollars into $2.5 million to support them. So then we said, oh, we're on to something. But then we realized that you know, there was a little bit of beginner's luck there, that actually lining up banks um, particularly in other countries, you know, you say, well, we'll do this deal, and okay, you need this much of a kind of a guarantee down payment, and then you, and then you go, okay, well, now we got to go raise it, and then by the time you raise it, the person's been transferred out of the position, and you can't do it. So, so then a very interesting thing happened. I don't know if you know the John Doerr, the venture capitalist in California, but he called together in his home uh, uh, some. Uh, some people to talk about microfinance, and Muhammad Yunus was there, I was there, our board chair at the time was there. Our current board chair was also there. Some very senior people from Google were there. And basically, we, we didn't come up with a set agenda, but what emerged is, is that people, is, is we took an idea off the shelf that one of my board members, which was what if people could contribute money, not contribute money, basically pledge assets that they would remain in their bank account, but in the case of a default, they would have to release them. And we would create a pool. Um, and that pool, we could then deploy for a deal at any point, once, it was, once we had access to it. And so, but to really make it work, and all the legal fees and everything, as we said, we should need to be at least $15 million that we'd have access to. So 15 families all contributing a million pool. And then we could just do it in any amount. Um, 
although it turns out we didn't do anything less than 100,000 or more than 5 million. Um, and it was theoretically, it could be a way for people to give massively, because you're not just giving, but it's usually leveraged uh, 10 times in India, three or four times in the Philippines. So we've been on this idea. So John Doerr said, why don't we all in this room contribute 0.1% of our net worth to this facility? What do you think? Um, and, uh, and so for me, I said, well, that's not a lot for me. <laughs> but for the people in the room, we did some back of envelope thing. We said it was about probably about, that would, 0.1% of the people in that room was about $35 million. <laughs> so so we, people kind of, that moment came, and he literally would point, well, that's so the process side. So people started holding up their hands, looking at their wives and husbands, can we do whatever? And we said, we'll just talk with you. But okay, we get there's some interest here. So it took us nine months, 10 months to put it together, but we put together the first in the world facility. And the actual amount of money people brought in, some did way more than 0.1%, some did less, some did nothing. But we actually got $31 million committed, where people said, I'll put it into the pool. And if there's a, a default on one of these loans that we're guaranteeing, then we'll pay out proportionally. So then we had to actually deliver. Uh, and uh, and the, I tell the story in the book is kind of part of the update is the good news is is that that facility thirty one million dollars as of last month was fully deployed all thirty one million and it's and it is leveraged over one hundred and forty million dollars of resources locally for microfinance so in a Nigerian bank we put up a million dollar guarantee they lend to a Grameen type program in Nigeria, $4 million. So over the course of several dozen transactions, and, and there hasn't been one default. So all those families that put up collectively $31 million, they've been able to invest that money all along. Uh, it's still theirs, it's grown, and yet it, it collectively, for every dollar they pledged, $4 plus has moved from sitting in a bank the bank might have sat on or lent to a, uh, a wealthy business person or something to microfinance institution that in turn doled them out $100, $200, $50 at a time. Um, so that's been kind of the progression. And, and really, it's like, like um, the situation with, um, um, uh, with Grameen Bank. There were just individuals in this process, the Steve Rockefeller, the Susan Davis, who was our board chair, was dreaming this up, who just at critical moments just shifted kind of a little mini part of history. Uh, and, and what happened is over time, more and more resources flowed to people who needed them that could be activated to change their own lives. Um, so it's been a fun process, and there's, there's big plans going forward. Of course, all organizations do, I guess, uh, and uh, we're not exempt from that. So let me end with a final thought um, that I, I give talks about microfinance sometimes, and uh, people think, oh my god, you, the, the whole thing, the frontier of innovation and development of microfinance is closed. You guys seem to have it all handled. Uh, maybe in Bangladesh, pretty close to that. But globally, uh, the, the thing I will respond if people say that, as I said, it's the best analogy I can think of is the, this thing I read in the New Yorker of a medical school professor, day one of classes, saying, um, saying to his students, I read this, he said, over the next four years, half of what we're going to teach you um, is wrong. We just don't know which half. And so I thought, I said, here's a profession that's been around a couple thousand years, and they're saying that half of what we're teaching you will think is wrong medicine, wrong treatment strategies in, I don't know, a d decade or two. I said, in microfinance, I don't think we're even at half. I think we're at like 20% of what we're teaching now in terms of actually well, serving well the needs of the um, of, of poor women and, and uh, uh, is best practice, sound practice. But we're learning, and there's an enormous amount. And I just, the, the, the frontier, just to tantalize you a little bit, um, is you've had to set up enormous infrastructure around the world. And there are new organizations coming into uh, all the time. There's a new organization called Grameen America, a kind of sister organization of ours. And in fact, one of the people associated with that, uh, Tanya? Right, who's, who's right here, uh, just introduced herself to me. We're a big growing family. We don't even all know each other, kind of like probably Google. Um, is, uh, um, is we set this infrastructure to serve about 130 million families with microfinance. And we actually, an NFI usually has weekly contact with them, does business with them. They make their loan payments. They have to review loan proposals from others. I mean, that's the basic way that it works. Uh, meet in the, this peer group, solidarity group. You set up an infrastructure to 
that touches all these people every seven to 14 days. And, and the issue, we're starting to realize what, given that we've set up this infrastructure to do that, and, and in the process earn the trust of people, right? Because this is, this is what people need money delivered on time in amounts they need without the exploitation. People really value that. So that creates a relationship that can be very robust. And so, so the analogy I was thinking on the plane up today, I said it's almost as if what we're discovering is like so what, what, you know, what Larry and the people around Google is that you created a search engine. And yet, in the process of doing that, you create the possibilities for so much more. Uh, and now Google is at the point, it seems, I, I'm not a technology you know, um, expert, but is, is now exploring all the possibilities that opened up by creating a search engine at that time that touched so many people in so many different ways and, and so much information. Uh, and so microfinance, we're saying, my gosh, with that infrastructure, piggybacking on top of that, you can do some things that would be impossible or much, much more costly if you didn't do it. And just, I'll give you one example. Sometimes I give four or five, but I'll restrain myself. Um, is uh, several years ago, Grameen got a little money to play around in the renewable energy space and uh, had to import the solar panels. Price is very high. The Japanese were buying up all the solar panels in Asia. But they said, yeah, let's try it. And uh, played around some models of, and basically the basic product was a solar home system. So you buy a solar panel, It'll power a, a light, a few things in the household, maybe a black and white TV, uh, if you have it, something like that. And it could go bigger, so you could sell a little energy to neighbors, or if you got it a business, to sell it to businesses in the market. So <coughs> Professor Yunus said, ah, oh, this is a tough, this is a real slog to, to make this work. Uh, prices are so high, and the technology, getting it out there. Um, but, uh, we're gonna, but if we ever get to a point, Alex, where we make do 100 solar home system installations per month, we think we, by that point we could be, in, be able to do this almost commercially. Uh, and we're going to have a big celebration then. So I said, great, let me know, sir. Well, he came to our board meeting two years ago in LA, and he's reported. And I kind of lost a little track of that. He said, we just did our first month where we had more than 3,000 solar home systems installed in a month. And now, I, recently, it's now up to 5,000 per month. And, um, and Grameen doesn't have any real core expertise or it didn't innovate in the renewable energy space at all. It was just utilizing the brand, the infrastructure, the relationships um, to take an existing product that's not that good and very expensive and heavily taxed in Bangladesh and indirectly tackling the problems of energy not available to poor and, and also in its own way global warming and climate change. So. Um, uh, and then the, my big insight, so I said, I don't know what, th what that means really, though. And so I asked a friend who would actually did a Fulbright with Grameen Shakti, the company in Bangladesh that, um, uh, that did this. I said to her, I said, I said, April, I said, just place on a map, you know, of all the programs doing you know, renewable energy in the developing world, where does this stack up? Is it even on the map? I mean, you know, I mean, you know about it because you were there. And she said, I, I'd say it's generally acknowledged to be among the top three in the world. And it's the only one of the three that doesn't have ongoing operating subsidies of some kind. Because it's been profitable. As a, it's, it's a nonprofit organization that earns a profit <laughs> uh, and has been out for three or four years. And so then I said, my god. Again, with no core engineering expertise, no innovation, no breakthrough, to reach that, what's the magic? Is that, is that is the built, the, you know, it's like the building the interstate highway system. Right? Connecting, but it, now you're connecting the global economy and the, and the poor. Or as I say in my book, and no one's ever challenged me on this. I, I have to have a debate. Someone challenged this. Uh, so if you want to, please. I say, microfinance has effectively, is almost as a byproduct, has created the largest network of poor people in world history. And it's not a network where you sign a thing, I'm, I support this, you never heard again. Every 7 to 14 days, you're back in touch with that network. Physical contact, as close as I am to you all. Um, how can you leverage that? What are the possibilities? What are the possibilities when the children of those borrowers start getting education? High school, grammar school, college, mobilizing them as a, um, as a force for social good, for political mobilization, um, for good candidates. But I won't go talking about that. Um, so, so this is, anyway, so this is what's exciting to me. Uh, this is what I've been doing the last 20 years. I really appreciate you all coming out and uh, showing some interest, and especially the hosts, and thank you very much.
I guess the floor is open for questions. Here, please. I've got two, so pick one, maybe. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. What do you think of the fact that you know you work with poverty and hunger? And in the U.S., probably more people are dying for over uh, feeding, what's the word, whatever. Yeah, being overweight. Than, yeah, than for starvation. And the second one, I mean, choose one. Uh, what do you think about the fact that, you know, the richest country in the world probably is to his knees because of credit and, you know, bad credit organization? <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's always interesting trying to tie these things. To, it's a little bit dangerous to kind of current events and what we're all talking about and thinking about here. I, I I think that really the, you know, what what I think that microfinance is. Um, I'll take your second question. My wife, who's a dietitian by training, could probably weigh in on the other one uh, uh, better than I could. But um, microfinance is, on one level, it's it's ethical subprime lending, right? Um, and, uh, and in fact, I was told by someone recently who really knows this field that subprime lending really began with a, a real social change ethical grounding, and it kind of lost its way. Um, and, uh, and then people just got very clever in all the repackaging of all these things. But, but microfinance, you know, but I think, and microfinance, by the way, there are elements of it, uh, and I explore this in my Stanford article. Um, uh, there, there are parts of microfinance that are being accused of being loan sharks, subprime lenders in the negative sense that we mean it right now. And there are enormous debates. What does it mean to be an ethical micro lender and not? And uh, there's a lot of disagreement on that. Um, but what Dr. Yunus did, very, he, he I think is always, what I love about him, he's always gravitated to things that are both very practical and that keep what he's doing, no matter how big it becomes, rooted in the core values, right? And that's a challenge for any company. I mean, of course, Grameen also went through a major re tooling, re-engineering in the late 90s. That's, that's the other story. But what he did, a few, as part of this re-engineering, actually, he did, he did five, he basically said, I'm going to judge every loan officer, every branch, every whatever, on five things. Three of them, you might say, would just be, would, could be done for any bank. Uh, is, the, is the branch profitable? Is the branch self-sufficient in funds, more in deposits than savings? Um, and does it have 100% payment, repayment? And typically, um, microfinance repayment is 97 to 98% of the loans are paid back. But if you were 100%, you'd get you know, um, a kind of a star, each, each thing in a different color star. But it doesn't stop there. And a lot of that is people in microfinance kind of aping the banking community and trying to attract its talent and its attention have kind of stopped there. And he said, but wait. Not quite. The first star is about is what percentage of school-age children of Grameen borrowers are in school. And you only get the star if it's 100%. If one isn't, you don't get the star. And the last one is, it's the hardest one to achieve, is are all the borrowers who've been borrowing for more than four years out of poverty? And they say, how do you know? Well, you, you create a very simple checklist. Um, and basically, the, the kinds of things that distinguish people that are above the poverty line, maybe not that far from people below it, he said, if, you, if, it's, if a family is 10 out of 10 on these indicators, then we'll say they're out of poverty. Uh, and so when 100% of the borrowers who've been had four years to do it. So I think that, and, and that kind of thinking, and, and Grameen Foundation, we're trying to always take some of the best ideas from Bangladesh and, and globalize them. And, um, uh, and we've tried to take a generic version of this, these 10 indicators. Um, but without those, I think that actually what we're trying to do could drift towards um, you know, the, the, this subprime lending, which is the root of this whole problem, I think. Um, and, uh, and, that, um, and, that's, and I think that's still a risk for our field. Some, some of us are very worried about that. So please. Well, what are, what are like one or two of the biggest Well, there are two. Uh, our core area, we're active in doing microfinance in two U.S. cities, Dallas and, and New York. Um, but the core of our work is um, is to try to take Grameen to other emerging or developing countries. And there was a lot of a lot of doubts in terms of could this apply outside of Bangladesh? There's something special about Bangladesh. Uh, and uh, uh, and then also just 
a lot of lack of trust in terms of, well, but if you're looking, working through these agencies, they're probably corrupt, and how do you know, and you're just a small group, and track all these things. So a lot of just basic, that, you know, if people would grant that what was going on in Bangladesh was successful, actually, it, that it could work elsewhere, and that we could be a, a kind of a partner to people and foundations to be part of that, but a lot of skepticism. Here in the US, uh, I think the, the issue is more that people felt that, two things. One is that people felt to start a business, you needed tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and, and that turned out not to be true, although I had to learn that researching this book. Um, and um, the other thing is people say, well, businesses, businesses, you know, business go out of business all the time, especially small businesses. Uh, and it's interesting because, number one, I, what I learned is, is that, uh, to tell a compact version of a story that, uh, something I heard is that in Project Enterprise, our partner in New York, a woman who just learned in a little class offered by the park district um, to have a little bit about becoming an amateur photographer, she bought a camera, a nice camera, $700, and just had this insight that there was a kind of a working class neighborhood near hers. She just went by the beauty parlors. And these aren't Fifth Avenue beauty parlors, but I just would take pictures of women after they came out of the beauty parlor when they looked their absolute best <laughs> and sell them the pictures, made money. You know, <laughs> didn't take eighty thousand dollars. And the other thing, um, but this is the the conventional wisdom. The other thing is people say, well, business is quite a business all the time. So how are they ever going to make this? And these are the people undercapitalized on this. Yes, but you know, we think of it in the terms of a very big formal business. The reality is, what pe the way people patch money together in this country and also in Bangladesh and India, uh, to a large extent, is that um, uh, is you know they they sell. You know, they sell something from their porch for three months, and then you know, demand goes down or the season changes. So they stop doing that, and they, but they've worked their capital, and they move their capital into a consignment business out of someone else's store. And, then they, and that kind of goes, and, that little, and they go and they do nails in someone else's shop, or they open a, you know, um, um, you know, some, and so you can look at that as a way, well, wow, just a lot of business failure after business failure. Well, yes. But also, they retained their capital each time. They shifted into a business that was more in tune with what their family situation allowed, with what uh, the market demanded, with what they were good at, with what they had connections could open up for them. So I don't know, you know, but in reality is that's a success. That's patching together money to make things work in this economy. And yet, if you look at it through a traditional lens, you're just saying, wow, you failed five businesses in the last four years. You know? but Actually, but each time, but you were succeeding, but your businesses weren't for more than a defined period. So it's the whole lens with which we look through business in this country tends to exclude people. Uh, so uh, anyway, I could, I could say more about that. Uh, I do want to just say one thing. I'm not going to go. There's a collaboration that we're doing with Google. I know some of you from Google, some of you aren't. It's not publicly announced, so I actually can't speak about it um, with a, a kind of a mixed group. Um, however, uh, there is a contact person, and Amber will be following. I will let you all know. If you want to be aware of that, feed into it. My cousin is doing his kind of one day a week at Google that you can do anything or whatever that system is, is, do, is actually working with this program that we're in collaboration with Uganda. Others of you might be able to plug in that way. But if you want to be aware of it, it's going to be publicly announced in November. We're trying to get some really good results to then you know, uh, communicate about um, before it go public with it, because two pretty big names in technology and microfinance. But if you want to find out about that, the contact person, both at Green Foundation and at Google, um, we'll, we'll let Amber know, and she can communicate to all of you um, and know that. But um, one more question? OK. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of large organizations that have been trying to address poverty for years, and they've received a lot of criticism. I think of the World Bank, for example. There's yeah. enormous amounts of money, and um, often not a lot to show for it in terms of actually reducing poverty. From your experience with Grameen, are there um, lessons or recommendations that you would have for these uh, large organizations that could help them to be a lot more effective? Yeah, well, certainly a lot of people. And I think uh, on days where Dr. Eunice wakes up on the wrong side of bed, he, people will say, well, just close them down. Just, just phase them out. <laughs> you know, these are, you know, or at least from the perspective of trying to address poverty, which is supposedly their core purpose, um, you know, there are all, all sorts of, you know, uh, if, if you're a if, if business like the World Bank is to lend $2 billion a month, 
uh, and that's fundamentally, I think, how people are incentivized. And then to, to try to do things that where the ultimate product is a $75 loan, and to work out that whole value chain and to power that, and then you bring in all your consultants who tell you all the ways that it won't work, and then it doesn't work. And um, but interestingly, Dr. Yunus got so frustrated. He, he, in fact, he said to the World Bank several times, he said, take every project you've done in Bangladesh and rate it uh, not on a scale of 1 to 10, but he said on a scale of negative 10 to positive 10. So negative 10 is was horrible. The poor suffered terribly. Way, set them way back as a group. But plus 10 is the, the other thing. And, and rank them all. And publish it. And let people dispute it or, or affirm it. That you think your analysis is right, make it public. Eh, they never quite took him up on that. <laughs> but he had another thing that he um, uh, proposed to them, which was, he said, well, you all want to get involved in microfinance. They offered him money many times, $200 million uh, at one point. He, he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to have the whole consultants coming and settling it with him, telling him, him how to do his business. He'd rather mobilize the money locally. But he did say at one point, he said, well, what you could do is you could, um, he, was, he was starting to think is you could set up a kind of a, like a central bank to lend to other microfinance organizations. Uh, and in fact, he was actually seeding competition, and he did it consciously, that would actually make his life more complicated down the line. Because it was kind of a, not a monopoly, but there were only really two or three national level players in microfinance. But he said, to cover the whole country and to make us sharp, there should be competition. So he said, set up this kind of a wholesale fund. Um, and, uh, and so they started to, 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 uh, to do that. But then he got a little worried. He said, but if it starts with the World Bank imprint on it from day one, it's going to have a certain character, and I'm not sure of how it's going to work. So he said, he got the government to put up $13 million initially, the Bangladesh government, to seed this fund and told the World Bank, stay out of it. Well, they were very frustrated. And they actually went and, and funded a big thing like that in Sri Lanka. And uh, I don't want to go into how that went, turned out. But then that, with its sea legs, with real Bangladesh, Bangladeshi resources seeding it, and then once they got their sea legs, got confident, and said, we could continue to rotate this $13 million. But then they invited the World Bank in. And World Bank put in $100 million and then $175 million uh, into that. And I think there was one final big uh, amount, uh, you know, uh, nine-figure uh, amount that went into it. And that was become one of the big World Bank success stories. And they actually repeated it, not quite as good, but in a number of other Asian countries. So I, I don't know what the lesson there is exactly, ex except that uh, except that here was a case where it was something truly designed by a social entrepreneur in some ways designed, one of the genesis was how to, how to actually create something the World Bank could really do well. Uh, but got its sea legs, didn't have the World Bank stamp on it from day one. Uh, invited the World Bank in, but had other options. Uh, and then it, it, it turned out well. But, it's, uh, but that's not, unfortunately, the, um, and there are a lot of dedicated, very dedicated people who work at World Bank and these international organizations. But I just don't think they're that well set up the way that international development and poverty projects are typically conceptualized. To, to be successful that often. Um, and, uh, but this was one case, and Dr. Yunus had his, his role in it. Of course, I'm horribly biased in terms of assessing the World Bank's performance in Bangladesh. But, uh, but anyway, that's, that's my thought. Um, so, so I think I'll turn it back to Amber. I think there may be some set up where I can sign some books. I don't know how it's set up exactly. But again, thank you so much in this crazy time of year. Very busy for everyone, financial uncertainty to come hear about this. Um, and this, this very quiet, miraculous thing happening around the world. Just thank you so much.